Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. As usual, just a couple of announcements. The fall semester schedule is done. We'll be offering a lot of great classes through the Wellness Farm Institute, including basic science classes like statistics, psychology, and biology, um, and then some disease-specific classes like obesity and nutrition. Dell will be teaching his institutional food management class and we'll be offering the diet and lifestyle course not with the celebrity instructors, so it'll be at a uh, same same curricula, same 39-hour course, but um, it will be taught by regular institute staff. So this is an opportunity to take the course, and it's not quite as expensive if you do it in the fall. All right, so let's go. Oh, and by the way, if you're a member, check out the members' website. We're posting new videos every week, and they are really great. Um, I'm in some of them. That's why they're great. No, I'm kidding. All right, so they, but they really are good. Check out the members' website. We post a lot of good stuff there. All right, two topics I want to talk about today, and the first one is diet and cognitive decline. I've been talking a lot about this Alzheimer's issue and, and memory loss because it is so important and because it is so important that you start doing the right things now so that you don't end up in this situation. So uh, this study that I'm talking about involved following people who were 55 years of age and older, um, eating, a, and, and they looked at their diet and the risk of cognitive decline. So over 27,000, almost 28,000 people living in 40 countries for an average of five years of follow-up. Now at the beginning of the study, none of the patients had a history, high risk of cardiovascular disease or a history of diabetes, heart disease, stroke, or congestive heart failure. So any of them that developed heart disease or stroke or anything like that during the study period, they just stopped evaluating them and stuck with the rest of this group. A baseline measurement of cognitive function included the test of thinking and memory, and participants were tested two years and five years after that. Patients eating the healthiest diets had a 24% reduced risk of thinking and memory loss when compared to those who ate the least healthy diets. Now, if you're wondering what was the definition of healthy diet, it was defined as not including much red meat, moderate alcohol consumption, and a high intake of fruit, vegetables, nuts, and fish. The author cited previous studies that also showed this connection between eating a healthier diet and reduced risk of cognitive decline. And they basically said that, um, that uh, their larger cohort, their large cohort study, allowed them to make more precise associations between diet and cognitive outcomes. Uh, they wrote, in conclusion, we report that higher diet quality is associated with a reduced risk of cognitive decline. Improved diet quality represents an important potential target for reducing the global burden of cognitive decline. What they're trying to tell you, if you don't want to end up in a nursing home with Alzheimer's disease, eat a better diet. Starting now. You know, you can't do this when, you're, when you've already been committed to the nursing home and undo it. So the time to do it is now so you don't end up there. Um, I think that um, the evidence is becoming ridiculously clear that Alzheimer's disease, memory loss, cognitive decline, people becoming senile. This is very, very preventable. I mean, just last week I did a, um, I did a video clip on the value of social engagement and intellectual stimulation in, in lowering the risk. So, so much you can do to make sure that you don't end up being another helpless person living out your older years in one room in a nursing home. I, I don't want to end up that way. I really don't. I don't think you do either. As I said last week, the problem isn't that any of us plan to end up there, but if you don't want to end up there, you got to have a plan to not end up there, right? That's what I'm promoting here. All right, this is a scary thing. Uh, I've talked about it before, but I want to talk about it in a little more detail. Most of the antibiotics manufactured in this country are not prescribed to humans by doctors. In fact, 70 to 80% of these antibiotics are purchased with no prescription by farmers who buy them at feed stores and use the drugs as growth promoters. And the reason is that if you give daily antibiotics to animals, you prevent infection when they're all in close quarters like that. But the biggest thing is they fatten up faster without eating quite as much food. Now this is financially a great deal for the farmers, but as I'm gonna point out here, not so good for the humans who are consuming these foods. In 2013, Consumers Union analyzed pork chop and ground pork samples from various sources and reported that 69% of the products were contaminated with Yersinia enterocolitica. All right, some of these are pretty long names. A bacteria that can cause fever, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Between three and seven percent of the samples contained salmonella, staph, 
and listeria, and 11% contain entero, entero, uh, enterococcus, which is an indicator of fecal contamination. Now, doesn't that just make your mouth water, all right? All of these bacteria can cause foodborne illnesses in humans. And some of the bacteria in these various samples were resistant to the, back, to the antibiotics that are normally prescribed to treat infections in humans. And this antibiotic resistant bacterial infection thing is becoming a much more important thing, significant issue in the United States today. In 2011, the United States government collected samples of beef, ground turkey, pork chops, and ground meat from supermarkets and tested it and discovered that over half of the samples contained bacteria resistant to antibiotics. Um, another group, the, the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring Program, uh, found that 87% of meat samples from grocery stores were contaminated with bacteria indicative of fecal contamination and antibiotic resistant forms of bacteria. So two different research studies done by two different groups showing fecal contamination of animal foods. I mean, I don't eat animal foods right now, but I gotta tell you something, it doesn't make me feel like I wanna go back to having them after I read this stuff. Two species of the bacteria found are the leading causes of infection in U.S. hospital intensive care units. Now, the scary thing that's going on right now is that antibiotic-resistant infections used to be um, common in hospitals, but you didn't see them in the community. Now we're starting to see these in non-hospitalized patients. Um, this is very, very concerning. But it gets worse than this. In addition to antibiotic-resistant bacteria, animal food actually contains antibiotics too. Uh, and this is according to Martin Blazer, author of a great book called Missing Microbes. In fact, I'm doing advanced study classes on that book uh, this month. And in fact, the government widely acknowledges this and has established legal limits for the drugs. Milk can have as much as 100 micrograms of tetracycline per kilogram, which means that a child who has two glasses of milk a day, which a lot of kids drink more than that, is drinking 50 micrograms of tetracycline every day. Now you might think, well, that's a pretty small dose, but you see what the farmers can do is they can use a lot of different antibiotics, and there's an upper tolerable limit for each of those antibiotics. So a child can theoretically be consuming two or three dozen antibiotics all under that legal limit, which add up to collectively a big dose of antibiotics. That's how we get antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. Um, so I think we can safely say that antibiotics in the food supply are doing a little bit to contribute to our growing epidemic of antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. Now, many people are becoming, fortunately, a little more cautious about taking antibiotics every time they get sick because they recognize the risks associated with constant antibiotic use. But unless you discontinue consuming um, conventionally grown land animals and farm-raised fish, you're getting antibiotics every day in the food supply, every time you eat these things. Um, and the other thing too, and I think you should think about this a little bit, I just encourage you to, is that not only are you causing health risks for yourself, but you are financially supporting a practice that threatens human health. And that's these farmers that feed antibiotics to their animals every day. Now these are some of the reasons why Wellness Farm Health has always aggressively promoted the idea that if you're going to continue to eat animal foods, they must be organic or wild caught if they're fish and cannot come from these conventional farms. Two purposes here, it decreases risks for individuals who are consuming the animal foods, it dries up demand for foods that are placing the entire population at risk. Now some people complain that organic animal foods are more expensive, they are. Wild caught fish, more expensive, but two things to consider here. One is that as you change your diet more in favor of a wellness farm style diet, your grocery bills are going to go down, even with the inclusion of some animal foods in the diet, because foods like rice and beans and potatoes are pretty inexpensive. We eat a whole lot of those. But the other thing is that if you think about this for a minute, you might start to realize that in, you're paying lower prices for food right now if you buy conventionally raised animal foods in exchange for the potential for dealing with very expensive and even life-threatening diseases later. And this is not really such a great trade-off when you think about it. And I think when more people know about it, uh, they'll think the trade-off maybe isn't worthwhile. So um, if you're going to consume animal foods, wild-caught fish, organic land animals, no more than three servings a week. That's always been our upper limit. None's okay, too. I've chosen none. 
and not unhappy about that decision. All right, that's all for today. Now, I will not be back to you on Thursday with news. On Thursday, you're going to hear from my very capable colleague, Julie Gardner, registered dietitian who works in our office, who does a great job of analyzing the medical literature like I do, and she's got some great ideas to share with you too. So I'll be back to you next Tuesday with more news.